I hope everyone's staying healthy and safe and thanks for being here for the class. I'm really excited to talk to you more about experimentation in zero gravity, especially from a biological lens. Um, yeah, so right now I'm working on astrobiology. I'm working on a few different directions in there. Um, a lot of the research that I did in the past few years was looking at uh, biochemical and biological systems um, that are in high radiation environments, but also in microgravity. So I was fortunate enough to be part of the zero gravity flight last year. And I'll talk about the experiment that I did with the mediated matter group at the end of this presentation. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start a little bit with the history of parabolic flight and microgravity research, especially its ties to human space flight, because that's always been an influence that's directly related there. So then we'll talk a little bit about what makes parabolic flights unique vehicles for gravity and space relevant research and the variety of behaviors of physics and biology that have been observed in microgravity, and then end with some practical considerations and please feel free to say stuff especially near the end because I sort of want to hear where you guys are at with your projects and see if there's anything that I can help with because I learned a lot from the last time we did the flight and so I just want to try to optimize and make sure that you guys get the data that you want to get or the experiences that you want to have out of this flight. So introduction. Um, microgravity has long been one of the conditions of space that's inspired the most excitement because it's unlikely that most people will experience it in their lifetime. Um, so space environments, both inside built architectures and vehicles, so like in the ISS, for instance, and outside those, so in free space, have several factors which are pervasive and provide a lot of challenges, especially to life, but also to any objects or products that have been developed on Earth. And so everything that's been made on Earth is shaped by its own forces. So the radiation that we have present here and the gravity force that we have present here and everything else like that, the atmosphere. So that means every single thing that we do in space is by nature going to be novel because we're taking something from an environment that directly shaped it and bring it to a completely different environment, which is really exciting. So all of these things provide both challenges and opportunities for design and microgravity in particular has been an ongoing field of research for over eight decades. So this began way back around World War II um, so the field of subgravity research, as it was called at that point, was just beginning in Germany, and it was focused on the human perception of gravity and other external cues um, that have to do with human orientation in spaceflight. And there's actually a really complicated and kind of dark history on this, given the inhumane manner of experimentation done by some of the pioneers of the field. So. If any of you have heard of Dr. Hubertus Stroghold, um, he was one of the first researchers in the fields of space medicine and also astrobiology, and he coined those terms. But he first started doing experiments in Nazi Germany in really inhumane ways. And then he came to the US and joined the Air Force and started doing research with them. And that's where he really became known for astrobiology and space medicine research. So um, just in the interest of being good scientists and researchers and experimenters and knowing the history of um, the fields that you're from, I definitely encourage you to take a look at some of the papers that I'll send after this, just so you're aware of it. So he conducted experiments with Novocaine, um, applying Novocaine into the body during flight to study human orientation and disorientation in the absence of external pressure cues. Um, and other German scientists like von Dieringshofen began studying human tolerance to multiple G loads and subgravity in 1938 by putting aircraft into vertical dives. So in 1948, the US Air Force began experimenting with animals on high altitude rocket flights, which while not designed to study subgravity or microgravity exclusively, um, they were designed to expose animals such as rhesus monkeys to the potential hazards of space flight. So everything that was on that slide a few slides ago, all the different factors. So animals experience up to two or three minutes of subgravity during coasting and free fall of the flight um, on V2 rockets such as shown here. So that was actually a fairly long exposure to microgravity, which had not been done before um, and would take a while to do again. So parabolic flight experiments specifically to study microgravity for medicine, for astronaut training, and for engineering were proposed in 1950 by Dr. Fritz Haber and Heinz Haber at the Brooks Air Force Base in Texas. So the Habers proposed what they called the aircraft method and they described the use of modern aircraft to affect perceived microgravity changes for a pilot or passenger on a flight, and specifically the utility of this method for future aviation and scientific experimentation. So 
in the paper, which I'll also send after this, it's really fascinating because they lay out basically, um, imagine that you have a flight that's doing this sort of maneuver. This is what you would find. And at the end, they say the pilot is put into a gravity free state, or at least into a state of sharply reduced gravity, as soon as he dares throttle his engine. And probably because the Hubbards were part of the Department of Space Medicine, there was this immediate connection between the aircraft method, as they called it, and the study of human health in flight. And there were other simulation chambers that allowed for the um, study of influences of physical environmental factors on living organisms, such as a low pressure chamber and the human centrifuge, which actually there's several around the world now. Um, and the Hubbards defined the uh, parabolic flight microgravity phenomenon as a medical problem because of two reasons. So gravity as a physical factor of the environment has the outstanding property of being omnipresent and everlasting. So not a single individual has as yet been away from its influence for more than one or two seconds back in 1950. And zero gravity and subgravity will greatly gain importance as environmental factors of man since the development of rocket craft points towards a rapid increase of velocities and altitudes in the not too distant future. So they were definitely correct and looking very far ahead considering the space race happened and then now we're here 80 years later working on very similar research. And early experiments began the year after the Haber's paper was published in California, so in 1951. And that started with just a few seconds of free fall for test pilots Scott Crossfield and Charles Yeager. And this allowed for the first recordings of human sensation and reaction to perceived microgravity. So just a few years earlier, the use of a F-94 fighter allowed for 30, um, 30 to 40 seconds of free fall, which was sufficient for a round of medical experiments to be performed. And in the late 1950s, a C-131B cargo transport vehicle allowed for experiments to be conducted and the Mercury program astronauts to train, which is shown here during a parabolic flight and in each parabola they had 10 to 15 seconds of free fall. And that's basically the model for the type of parabolic flight that you're all preparing for as part of this class. So in the years between 1959 when the Mercury astronauts were going through their free fall experiments and now there's been a growth of commercial interest in parabolic flight and space flight in general and more opportunities than ever for uh, experimentation and experience of microgravity. So on to designing experiments for zero gravity. So I'm guessing at this point, all of you know generally what you're doing and the essential plan of the flight and the durations of exposure to the different gravitational forces and some of the technical requirements as well. So I wanted to dive in a little bit further. So the flight offers the opportunity for both microgravity and hypergravity over the course of each parabola, which means while we've been um, talking about and focusing on the less than 1G aspects of the flight, and that's what people tend to think about when they think about these flights, we can actually investigate the effects of the flip side too. So um, on this diagram, which is from the zero gravity group, uh, you can go up to 1.8 Gs as well. So partial G levels that mimic moon and Mars gravity are also possible during the flight maneuvers. So instead of just thinking of like binary Earth versus microgravity, there's an entire range in there. And that makes it really interesting because you're thinking about gravity as like a continuous property. So a lot of times parabolic flight is explained in terms of some of its disadvantages. So in a lot of the papers that I've read or I've heard about, there's um, this mention of only short durations of microgravity. So 10 to 15 seconds, but it's repeated over and over and over again. Or it's framed mainly as a preliminary test bed for future ISS experiments, which would be in prolonged microgravity. And this is definitely true. These flights are cost effective and they're comparatively easier to coordinate and they're ground based analogs that can recreate conditions experienced during spaceflight. So they are a good test for future ISS missions, for instance. Um, and in the landscape of ground based analogs and space based experiments, parabolic flights have their own sorts of pros and cons that are there. So what are some of the unique benefits of this environment? I don't know if you guys do a participatory class, but does anyone want to say what they think are the unique benefits or ones that they're thinking about so far with those experiments? Jump in, yes to participatory class. I can't actually see you guys because I just see my screen. So just someone say something. <laughs> I guess the fact that you have uh, no gravity can 
I don't know, allow you to test things that uh, would not be possible on Earth. I'm not sure if I understand the question, to be honest. So, okay, let me explain a little further. So say you had the opportunity to do an ISS flight, so you have prolonged microgravity on the ISS versus mm. parabolic flight versus mm. a drop tower mm. um, versus on ground experiments. What are the benefits of parabolic flight specifically in comparison to everything else? Mm. I guess it's cheaper than if you send it to space. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. That's one of the things. Um, you get yeah. to, um, you as the operator can do some in-flight adjustments if needed versus um, sending it to space and not be able to touch it after that. Yeah, yeah. that's another really good one <laughs> because astronaut time on the ISS, as Ariel and I experienced, is very expensive. So um, you kind of want to do autonomous experiments unless you have the money to pay an astronaut. So that's a really good point. I think drop towers are um, uh, maybe easier to implement, but they give you like on the order of just seconds or hundreds of uh, microseconds of gravity, of, of um, partial gravity, zero yep. gravity. Yep, definitely. How much does it cost to hire an astronaut? <laughs> oh, Ariel, do you know the answer to that? <laughs> I only heard that it's very expensive. Try to avoid. It make it's sense. not a rate that NASA publishes. You can't like book them by the hour, but it ends <laughs> up being like a very expensive overall chartering cost because um, it just costs more to get your experiments reviewed for safety. So if your astronaut's going to touch it, every corner has to be ground down so it's smooth. Um, like pieces of tape have to be hidden so that they can't give themselves paper cuts, like all kinds of little things all of a sudden, in addition to like the big ones, like don't have a laser point in their eye and don't have a fume that's going to poison them. Yeah. This gets exponential really quickly. And so think about, you guys know Maggie's experiment, right? That she did last year, like um, gastronomy in space basically, or in microgravity. That's such a unique experiment that is really, really fascinating, but also Maggie's the best person to do it. So going on a parabolic flight is the exact right condition to do that type of research. So yeah, there's a lot of things that I think make parabolic flights the most exciting. And I always find that a good motivation point when I start designing an experiment, for instance. So um, a little bit more about that. So the combination of the hypergravity and partial gravity and microgravity is super useful. And understanding the effects of conditions relevant to space flight and combat flight even, um, which is why I guess the Air Force was interested at some point, but it also opens a comparatively wide window for probing how basic physics, physiology, and biology work at unnatural gravitational forces. So if you think about every single fundamental discovery that was made about how the world works, um, especially before we were able to do these experiments, so how plants grow to how fires burn, all of the insights are based on Earth gravity conditions. And so this factor is sort of taken as a given. So it's always going to be there. So we don't really consider it a factor in a lot of experiments. So it's under-recognized and under-explored. Because of course, when you're doing scientific experimentation, you want to be able to change the variables and you want to be able to give negative controls. But how do you do that with every single experiment that you do in a lab? You can't make zero gravity. So having a cheap way to affect basically changes in gravity allows you to introduce this new type of negative or positive control that we haven't been able to do so far. So introducing this entire new paradigm and control for every single experiment that happens in physical space, whether it's biological or physical, can redefine all of the basic insights that we have across fields. So cell biology, animal biology, plants, soft matter physics, fluid dynamics, material science, literally you name it, any kind of physical or natural science can benefit from starting to think about gravity as a tunable factor. And parabolic flights are a great vehicle to start doing this type of experiment. So even really basic stuff like does a candle go out? How does a um, hourglass move? Things like that. All relevant questions that we should think about um, on parabolic flights. And then the other thing is that the multiple parabolas of the flight offer an opportunity to test cycles, meaning that you can test things like the durability of a material, the rapid, rapid acclimation of someone to this type of flight, accelerated environmental extremes. Um, you could test things like human expectation and more, depending on the different model system that you're working with. And that's very unique to this type of flight opportunity. 
So then on to a little bit of the unnatural natures of physics and physiology. So this is a really expansive topic and I was having a hard time making this section. So I just kept it kind of brief, but what I'll do is send a couple of the reviews that I thought were the most interesting, especially in terms of human physiology, because I heard that some of you are doing work on maybe spacesuit related research. Um, so I think this will be relevant for you. So for humans in space, there's a lot of research that's been done, is currently underway, and is planned for the future. And microgravity in particular affects every system of the body. So the neurovestibular, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, bone, metabolic, blood, sensory motor, um, even mental health, things like that, can all be affected by microgravity. And on top of that, um, there's been some evidence that there's additive effects of microgravity plus, say, ionizing radiation on the human body. So astronauts that go into um, the ISS for a long period of time or would go beyond that to the moon will experience different effects than even with just microgravity than someone who's going on repeated parabolic flights because of the presence of everything else that's going on. So um, inside the ISS, for instance, there's elevated levels of carbon dioxide and there's potential contamination that's there. And if you're already in a weakened state because your body is having, say, space sickness due to microgravity, then you're put in that much of a worse condition. But teasing out sort of what are the factors that are happening in which place, in which order, which one has the most precedence is something that people are still researching and it's a huge field of research. Um, so finding as much data as you can collect and trying to tease out the variables that are related to each piece of data is really exciting right now. But generally, microgravity, a lot of the concerns that people bring up in terms of human physiology are um, space sickness, as I mentioned, systemic bone loss, muscle atrophy, spine stiffness, and disorientation. And so Interestingly, there have been a few recent studies that start looking not just at microgravity, but at hypergravity, which I was mentioning. This is why that entire range is really interesting. So this paper came out last year. <clears throat> I think it's in Nature NPJ microgravity. Maybe not. I'll send it also after this. But it showed that gravitation is, or gravity regulates bone and muscle mass in mice, which are commonly used as a model for all mammals, including humans or primates or things like that. So they found that, yes, um, microgravity decreases bone and muscle mass in mice, but then you can actually reverse this by exposing them to hypergravity. So just as we were sort of talking about before, gravity is this tunable factor that can be changed once you start thinking about environments that have both microgravity, normal gravity, and hypergravity. So this is just one of the figures that they had from the paper and they, they looked at two different bone systems, so the humerus and the tibia, to see uh, the density of the bone and the muscle mass in each case after being exposed to simulated ground-based conditions um, and then prolonged uh, microgravity conditions on the ISS. So they went up to 2G for their hypergravity. Um, and this is really fascinating because it's one of the few studies that actually starts looking at both sides of the spectrum. And so this means kind of this is on the, the cutting edge in terms of human physiology, which is really exciting. Um, and other studies have focused just on hypergravity. So there's a few different human centrifuges and hypergravity chambers that, for instance, ESA and NASA both have. So people have studied how that affects people, especially with disorientation, so astronauts during training. But there's a lot more information that we're trying to find out using different types of analytical methods. So MRI, for instance, to scan the brain or other parts of the body or CT scans to see the effect before and after exposure to the different conditions. Um, okay, so now onto the last part, which is more of the practical considerations. So for the last section, I'm gonna walk you through the zero gravity experiment that I did last year, so last November, I think, um, with the Space Exploration Initiative. And I did this with Joe Kennedy, Felix Kramer, Sarah Wilson, and Mary Osman from the Mediated Matter Group at the Media Lab. And so I'll go over the project idea and the aim and also talk through the different considerations that we had and then also issues that came up and practical considerations that you should be aware of as you plan your own experiments. And then at the end of it, please feel free to ask any questions or also if you want to talk through from especially anybody who's doing materials or biological research, I'd be happy to sort of go through some ideas and see where you could improve or try to have a more impactful experiment. So, okay, so setting the stage for this research, which is 
a little bit different and our research is sort of always in the area between science and design. So there's a little bit of artistic and poetic elements, but also data collection that we were doing. So we've been studying how silk is created by the domesticated silkworm, Bombyx mori, shown here as a larva ready to spin its cocoon on the left side, so that little caterpillar looking thing, and an adult moth, which is already hatched in its cocoon and standing on top of it um, on the right. So the main question we had was, how might silk spinning be affected by microgravity? So our project, which we called ZG Stardust or Ziggy Stardust, explored the broader theme of material formulation and fabrication in microgravity and considered the microgravity and hypergravity environment as a unique one for biofabrication and materials development. So potentially, this means that the products that are spun in this changing gravity environment can't be made on earth gravity, which is fascinating in terms of the design process, because that means that the environment is directly shaping or co-shaping the material that's being created by impacting not only the physiology of the organism that's biofabricating, but also the material itself. Because uh, one of the things that we had thought about when designing this experiment is silk, when it's freshly spun, doesn't feel like, um, like a silk scarf or something like that that's highly processed silk. So it feels smooth in all directions and things like that. Silk that's raw is made up of two different proteins and one of them is very sticky, um, so sericin. And as it's being spun, that's how you get cocoons that are super hard and tough and they're hard to break apart and you can't really rip them easily because of this gummy layer. And if they're being freshly spun and you're applying hypergravity, there's a chance that these layers are gonna come even closer together and you're gonna get even harder cocoons at the end of it. So there's this impact on the material that's being spun and on the organism that's spinning it. And so we wanted to study silkworms across all stages of life. So the egg, the larva, the cocoon, and the adult moth through the changes in their spinning patterns. So the ones that were spinning already, we would study how they're spinning as they're exposed to the different gravity environments. Um, and then those that come back and then are ready to spin, we'll see if their time in microgravity or hypergravity had affected how they start to spin compared to their ground-based controls. And then the last is with um, the eggs and the, um, the moths, which will then lay eggs. We wanted to see if the next generation of organisms will also be impacted. So uh, part of this is the desire to understand how insect-related studies can be conducted in unique experimental environments. So in this case, parabolic flights. Um, and insects are an interesting area of research that has been sort of neglected, I would say, because there's been such a huge focus on human-focused research. So everything that is related to humans, so primates, mice, things like that, things that you can think of as analogous to human systems have been focused on a lot. But insects are one of the most diverse groups of organisms, and it's very likely that if we go to another planet, for instance, we'll bring our insects with us. You've probably heard of the close mutualistic relationships that humans and bees have, for instance. And it's very likely that when humans go to other planets, they don't just bring humans, they bring everything else. So bacteria, fungi, insects, everything. So understanding more about how these guys operate will give us a greater insight into a few different organisms. And maybe eventually we could understand more universal principles of how microgravity and other space-related factors can affect life. So the images that I'm showing here are of one of the capsules that we designed for our silkworm companions to join us on the zero gravity flight. And we'd been breeding silkworms in lab for a while, so we were able to get fertilized and unhatched eggs, spinning larvae and cocooned larvae and adult moths in time for the flight. So these were the first practical considerations that we had. So what timeline do you need your experimental materials by? and you should work backwards from the date of the launch and bear in mind that sometimes the launch dates can change. So will you be ready if the launch moves by a day or by a month or by two weeks? And what do you need to do in order to be prepared for that? What will it take to be ready or to change things? So for instance, as in this case, we know that we could make the capsules early on and we can test them out and see if we like them or not and if they're the right size and all these different sorts of things because they're not dynamic, they're not changing, they're made of acrylic. However, anytime you work with more sensitive materials or biological materials, those guys have their own timeline. So it's well worth figuring out um, how that interacts with the timeline of the launch itself. And if you have to do things like fly to a location for your launch, how do you bring 
your biological organisms or specific materials that you need? Will they degrade over a period of time? Do you need to have them in for Celsius or at room temperature or something like that? Um, all of these different things should be planned out well in advance of when you do your launch so that you can, most of the time you can figure out a way to make it work. You just need to plan enough to make it work in advance. So this is a second capsule that we designed um, because we wanted to see how the setup also impacts the different organisms that we're looking at. So in the first, that was a bunch of Drosophila vials. Um, so they're basically really soft on one end and then the other end is just acrylic. And so the organisms can hang on to the soft side if they want to, and it'll be a little bit of a landing for them as they're going through hypergravity. In this case, we made smaller um, divisions within one capsule so that in case they do get knocked around, they actually don't go too far and generate too much velocity so that they get hit. And you can also uh, use a GoPro on one end to image what's going on here. Whereas in the first capsule, we didn't have a GoPro in there. So um, more generally, the two other considerations are the containers and the materials you're using. So you don't want things to shatter, which might happen when you're slammed to the floor in hypergravity or when your materials are. And if you're working with soft and biological materials, you wanna ensure that they don't move too much or they're cushioned when they're in motion. And there's a lot of different ways you can potentially do that. And then second, what's the data that you're trying to collect? Um, what will you measure before, during, and after your flight? And so in our case, we recorded the age of the organism, so how many days since they hatched from the egg, the stage of development they were in, the weight of the cocoons that were already spun, the weight of the different organisms, um, photos of our samples before the flight, and also of the setups, because um, this was an opportunity not just to do the, the materials work with the silk and the biological work with the silk worms, but also the design work of, is this a model that people could use for the future? Could you use the same type of setup with say, um, ants? Could you use it with caterpillars and butterflies? Could you use it with other types of insects or other types of organisms, period? Um, because it's always good to try to see how flexible your setup is and how it could be modified or improved. Um, so after flight, so oh, during flight, we wanted to take images, so time lapses or videos, of the organisms as they're moving. So you'll see in the second and third capsule, we have GoPro cameras in there. And then after flight, we repeated the same sort of test that we did pre-flight for a direct comparison. And then we also had ground-based controls. So these are the same organisms in the same setups, except they didn't go on this crazy flight. So small things can greatly impact the experiment. So for instance, we knew that the worms might get swung around a bunch. So we actually allowed them to begin cocooning in the actual environment uh, in a small space, which would help them develop their cocoon in the right shape so they could have a layer of protection um, during the flight. And then another important consideration is what people have done so far. So we developed the design for these things based on studies that people had done with Drosophila, um, some in space, but some also just uh, lab-based experiments. And we looked at if people have worked with silkworms in the past. So there are previous studies on China's Tiangong 2 in 2016, but that was one of the only studies that we could find that investigated the spinning of silkworms in microgravity, but the findings aren't yet reported. So it seemed like, okay, there's a good gap in the research that we could hopefully contribute to that would help the research we're doing, but also generally the field. And so I highly encourage you for whatever project you're doing, please check out journals like NPJ Microgravity, or sometimes PLOS One publishes stuff or Astrobiology and the NASA website where they detail all the different research that they've done um, in the different environments, especially for the ISS. So you can find the relevant information to contextualize the work that you're doing. So you can strengthen your own protocols and processes to make sure you're on the cutting edge and then also strengthen what your contribution is to the field, which is the best way to make the most use of any experimental time you have. So as you can see, this is the third capsule design. And so this one is a little bit different. We wanted to see um, what the different forms would be like in terms of someone actually carrying them on flight. So the first one, a lunchbox, was about this size. The second one was long and narrow, but also around this size. And then this was the smallest capsule. And you actually just wear it around your wrist. So the size is about this big. And this one was 3D printed, whereas the others we just cut with acrylic and then put together. And here we used a different type of imaging system, which we also um, use a similar one in the ISS experiment that Ariel mentioned. Um, so in this case, we used a GoPro camera, but we had a mirror, so a two-sided mirror, which was at an angle like this. 
So you each mirror was facing um, an organism which was on either side of the camera. So you could image both the cocoon on one side, for instance, and the silkworm on the other um, in pretty high resolution because the GoPros have pretty good resolution and they work perfectly for this flight. So each prototype provided enough support and 3D scaffolding structure to enable the worms in their spinning phase to cocoon. And um, in the end, we went with real-time video and not time-lapse because that just worked better for the short duration of the flight. And we wanted to observe any wing fluttering behavior of the adult silk moths in microgravity, but also the spinning head movement of the larval silkworms because they have a very characteristic head movement that they do, which is like a figure eight. So we wanted to see if that changes and if there's any movement of the other organisms as well. So if any of the organisms that are already in their cocoon start to move or if the cocoon changes shape. And there was also a poetic kind of element to this project. So the Bombyx mori silk moth and silkworm, they're highly domesticated. So they've been domesticated for literally thousands of years, probably 5,000 years. And they've been selectively bred to have this beautiful white silk. Um, but that also means they, they aren't found in any natural environments anymore. And the silk moth, the adult form, has also lost its ability to fly. So it has these wings, but it can't actually fly because the body is too heavy and the wings are usually deformed. So the flight kind of offered this poetic opportunity um, for this organism, which has been so exploited by humans that it can't fly anymore, to experience a type of flight for the very first time. So we want to try to capture that on video too. And so here's a little bit of <laughs> the video from launch. So this is our zero G flight launched, I think in August, 2019 from the Portsmouth International Airport in New Hampshire. And so Joe Kennedy was our flyer and he went with all of our little organisms in three capsules containing all the silkworms across stages under 15 arcs with 20 to 30 seconds of microgravity at each peak. So this is from the first period. You can see it's a really chaotic environment around. So that's something to definitely think about if you have something that isn't strapped down like we did. So we had two of our experiments strapped down and one of them, this capsule was just on his arm. So that's easy to get knocked around, but it's also close enough to the body that he could protect it. So this is after the first zero G period where they're all lying down. You can see Joe's breathing really hard <laughs> and the silk, uh, the silk worm is moving around and it's still doing its kind of spinning pattern. You can see the way it's moving its head, but it looks like the moth is just entirely still. And then this is the second period of microgravity. So you can see that if that capsule was any bigger, this larvae, which has a very soft body, would probably bash around a little bit too much, but it's a little bit suspended inside its own cocoon. So it's a little protected. Okay. And so this is after the second period of the microgravity. So this guy's still going along, climbing and spinning and doing his thing. <laughs> um, and so then this is some of the information from after the flight. So post-flight, we analyzed the changes in the spinning patterns of the cocoons using photography and scanning electron microscopy, as well as the development in the range of the different worms. So the larvae that were in stages four to five, they were able to successfully cocoon and they emerged as adult moths. And the female moth did lay eggs, the one that we had in the last video. The male moth, which we had put in, however, just didn't want to fertilize them. So that meant that that part of the study was truncated because if they don't fertilize, then you're not going to get the next generation. So the results from the study indicate that the motion within the hypergravity sections of the parabolic flights was the most significant factor in the final cocoon shape because this affected that stickiness of the Saracen heavy silk rather than the spinning process itself. So on the left side of the image, you can see the experimental cocoon and it's just way tighter. Um, whereas the control, which was done completely on Earth without any zero G flight, is much larger and it's more spacious, basically. And then the resulting cocoons, um, you can see that they're tighter and smaller also in the scanning electron images. So the control is on the right side, the experimental is on the left side. Um, I should have matched the same magnification. But essentially, what you see is there's just a little bit more layering and tighter packing. So there's fewer of those like large open spaces in the experimental sample. Um, so the other data that we got was that the prototype capsules that we made remained intact and they provided a successful containment to support the silkworms and didn't damage any of the humans or other experiments around, which is very important when a lot of the experiments are happening at the same time. 
And so this provided some good insights for the design of new support environments for insects and small animals in space. So now we know that these materials work for 3D printing, none of them shatter. Um, they're also easy to customize. The acrylic worked fine and you were able to see through, which is really useful for the imaging we were trying to do. And regardless, there's still a lot of things that we'd like to do differently especially regarding the repeatability aspects of the experiment. So in order to really get data that we can stand behind um, clearly, we'd have to repeat the experiment several times, or we could try to pick one capsule that we make in a larger container with many more samples in there. So that way we just have an N of 10, for instance, in the flight. So in comparison to lab-based work, which already requires a lot of planning, if you're working with materials or biology especially, any flight related work requires even more planning and contingency planning and pre testing. Um, so we would need to repeat this several times and then also we could smooth down the entire process, hopefully, by eventually deciding on one capsule, one set of materials and um, one age potentially for silkworms and have more samples per flight. So in conclusion, I hope the talk gave you a little bit more information about some of the histories, realities, and exciting opportunities in parabolic flight, especially as related to biology and soft materials. So when you're designing your experiments, please consider the following. So what are the aims of what you're doing? Um, they don't all have to be scientific aims. It's completely amazing to have aims that are poetic, that are inspirational, that are any other sort of thing like that. So for instance, it doesn't, really matter that much to the scientific community if the silk moths did fly or not. It was more just an interesting thing that we wanted to do as part of the research, but it's equally valid. Second is why parabolic flight? So really think through, are you using a parabolic flight because you hope to do a prolonged microgravity experiment on the ISS in the future? Are you making use of the entire space? Because for instance, some of the um, ISS or uh, suborbital flights, you're actually restricted to a much smaller space the way that we've been doing them so far in the past. So can you make use of all the dimensions of parabolic flight? Can you make use of the cycles and the hypergravity and the partial gravity and um, really embrace the fact that it is this unique opportunity? The next is the timeline. So plan backwards from what you want to do, especially looking at the dynamism and fragility of the materials or organisms you're using have a good plan for contingency. Um, so say for instance, you have to fly to a different location and TSA doesn't let you bring your samples aboard. What will you do in that case? Will you have a backup shipment? Um, think about the number of samples you're putting on the flight and if you want to do repeat flights and what the reality is that that will be. Um, controls that you'll do on the ground and within the flight itself. Setups for hyper and microgravity. So the materials that you're using, make sure they're soft or stiff depending what you want to happen and that they won't shatter if they are smashed or something like that. The data collection that you want to do before, during, and after the flight, and we can talk a little bit more about different systems that might work for that. Um, prior research and literature search, so you can contextualize your work and the findings that you have, and then the rest of the impacts for this. So how does this impact um, space research at this really exciting turn that we're at right now? And I think all of your projects definitely will, um, and we're at a great time to plan. So uh, after this, I'll send a bunch of the citations that I had for this presentation and further reading. There's so much more out there and there's so much to explore and I'm happy to talk about it basically whenever. So. Thank you. Very comprehensive, a ton of really just amazing insights. And okay, ask any questions. Yeah. I might have a little one about um, the, the fact that the fertilization uh, didn't happen after the female laid the eggs. Do you think it's because the male was disturbed by the zero gravity trip? It could be, but it also could not be. And this is where the issue is with the sample size. Our sample size was too low to actually know because mm. even on earth, sometimes they just yeah. don't fertilize. Partly is because they're so mutilated by bad human practices that you literally need to put them right next to each other so they can find each other and fertilize. But um, if we had done this with say 10 adult moths, 10 pairs of adult moths, then I could more definitively tell you they were probably disturbed or they weren't. So and maybe it's worth doing another fly uh, uh, or yeah, more flight experiment, I guess. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you joining the next one? Um, I don't think so, but I have plans for the future, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, if I summarize, um, I, I'm not sure if I understood what you 
you extracted from this experiment, the, the cocoon was a, li a little bit with a unusual shape. Is that the, the conclusion that it disturbed them in the way they, they created that cocoon? Yeah, so it seemed, so the takeaways from the experiment were basically one, the um, material effect. So the actual materials that were part of the silk impacted the shape of the cocoon because mm. of the environmental changes that were happening more than it seemed the spinning pattern of the worm itself. So that's one takeaway. The second is in case in the future, we do want to work on high density silk based materials, putting them into a centrifuge or another type of hypergravity environment might be a really interesting way to change the material formation. So there's a lot of work people have done so far in isolating saracen and fibrin, which are the two parts of silk, and putting them into liquid and then spinning them out in different ways or electro spinning. But so far, I haven't seen that much in terms of creating high density or multi-layer materials that have different properties. And this is one of the insights that I think is the most exciting because we wouldn't have really thought about that without doing this type of experiment that goes in hyper and uh, microgravity. And then I think the third thing was in terms of the setups that you can use reliably and safely in this type of um, environment. We think that the capsules that we created are pretty good so far, especially the little round one. That one worked super, super well. So if people want to do research in the future, also with silkworms, caterpillars, anything like that, we could at least say these are some good models and prototypes you can try. Is, I, I'm not sure it's realistic, but is, is there any hope to see the, the one that fly? try to fly in zero g is yeah. it something that you tried or considered because i would really be curious about that yeah so how they adapt yeah. yeah so one of the findings was that these guys tended to not want to let go of the surface i think that the motion was a little too much yeah so they have these little hooks on their legs and they were kind of like i'm just gonna hold on i don't want to let go so in order to really focus on that, so I, I dream in my head that there was one moment that it let go and I just didn't catch it on camera and it did experience this flight and all this stuff. What's more likely is that we would have to redo the experiment with a much softer substrate that they don't want to hold on so much, but it's almost like I'm imagining the equivalent of a man-made cocoon that you can still image through and that they would bounce off soft angles of it, but without actually being hurt there. And then hopefully you could see them actually try to fly. So that's for the next experiment. Is it, uh, is it any realistic to imagine uh, releasing a fly in the zero G flight, like in freedom? No, no, <laughs> no. So that, that's, <laughs> that's the other thing. Because there's people flying around, a lot of people with their mouths open and things like that. <laughs> and, you know, there's, uh, there's pros and cons of insect research, especially when you're doing it in open environments. We just like the paramount is safety and being super respectful of everybody else doing the research. If it was, if we had a flight just for ourselves, I would make this huge box and then we would put in the organisms in there and they would fly around in this contained setting. But for instance, one of the people in our group wanted to do work with bees. Um, and that was like a, a no, no. <laughs> because if someone has like an allergic reaction or something like that on the flight, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good safety point that Sonata brings up, which is um, the danger of trying to get away with something that zero-g didn't approve, or like a bee, for example, if a bee were to have gotten out. They stop the flight at the moment that they understand or detect the danger, and then they ground the flight, and you're done. You don't get to go back up and do the extra parabolas that you missed. So that's the real danger of like, um, not just your own experiment being flubbed uh, if you had, you know, some hazard that wasn't well enough contained, but you ruin everybody. Else. So that's why it's taken so seriously and that's why they said no bees. But I think Sonata's team did a really nice job with what they had available, just the tiny containers for the solutions. And then, yeah, maybe in the future, if um, needed matter and dairy want again, then you guys can do a little bit earlier. I think you guys got a wait list as well very end and so you like made amazing use of it yeah. almost no time to plan and prepare but if we if you guys applied at the beginning of the cycle you could probably also do a large box you know like some of the other experiments we do. Um, let's do one last question for Sunata and then um, we're gonna just go take a quick look at the hubs. So so I have I have a I mean it's not a question I was just wondering like um, like those um, those substrates that you used for for the moth 
to kind of like grip. Have you thought about like a smart surface materials like hydrophilic that changes to hydrophobic? So when it is actually in a microgravity, they cannot really grip on it, you know, like, so they're kind of forced to, to just fly and then, that's, and then like go, go back again. Yeah, that's a really good idea. And I think that whole direction of like things that actually change, substrates that change when you're in the temporal and gravitational section that you want to be in, that's a really good idea because that allows your substrate to react dynamically to the environment that's being created. We didn't apply that so far with this because it's almost like we had an order of operations for what was most important. So if we had to think of priorities with this, the top priority is to make sure that everybody else's experiment was not damaged by what we're doing um, and that we're able to do the entire zero gravity flight as planned. That's the two top things, which means definitely no shattering materials, nothing that could be damaging, nothing that could accidentally escape, anything like that. The next priority is making sure that the organisms are well contained so as not to cause any kind of issues for the organisms or for people who are flying around. So for that reason, we went with pretty like hard materials that would work well as containers but not shatter. But I think you're completely right. Like the next stage of it is to do a coating on the inside of one of the hard containers so that that will change dynamically and the organisms can respond to it. But yeah, coming up with almost the list of priorities that you have in mind can really help you decide on what practical things you want to do, especially in these super short periods in space and the materials you want to use or in microgravity and the materials you want to use. Um, because I think that's always the deciding factor. And if you would ask for my advice generally, I would say go for something that's more reliable and that is simpler to do and that you can actually get data that you can compare across parabolas and across flights if you do get to have them. Because if you have a one-off kind of experiment, it could be great or it just could not work at all. And that's it. Yeah. And tends to be harder to publish later because and that's what we try to point a lot of you guys to is to working a type of experiment that um, can get good enough data that you can publish something from it. So I think Sonata's points are really trenchant for that point too. Great. Sonata, thank you so much for your time. Really great presentation.